Hi, Misha here, and as I said in the recent kind of informal update, probably going to be doing some different stuff, showing some different models. And to begin with, I thought I would do an overview of uh, models of U.S. NASA space capsules on the far left here we have a mercury capsule this was a single man capsule operated from 1961 through 1963 moving over we have the Gemini or Gemini capsule. This was a two-man which first flew at least occupied, manned in 1965 and the program wrapped up at the end of 1966. And then of course we have the one that everyone's most familiar with Apollo. This is the the big and the, the three-person And uh, this really, I guess you could say, first flew, per se, in 1968, although an incident in 1967 makes it very famous. And it would actually be operated on a few different projects up until 1975. These are 1 25th or 124th scale models, depending on who you ask. I've seen them written both ways. And uh, I really didn't mean to get big ones, but a funny thing happened. I wanted some space capsules, and I thought I would just buy the Dragon models, the die-cast, the preformed ones, which are 172 scale. So, especially something like the uh, Mercury would be quite small. The thing is, most of those are out of production. You can still find the Mercuries, and you can still find some Apollos, but they're old stock and they're going for crazy money. And you cannot find Gemini. I've looked. Even if you could, I have a feeling they'd be well over $100, which just seems ridiculous. Also, the Dragons, while they're quite decently detailed, seem to be very fragile very fragile. Partially it's just they're small but also they have small little parts kind of pegged together just not really confidence inspiring. Now for the original list price of 20-30 bucks sure but for what they're asking on Amazon and eBay now honestly these larger scale models were um, the same money <laughs> These are made of uh, resin with some wood, and they do have removable hatches to look inside. That was the easiest one to remove single-handedly. They're just they're just you know sitting in there. But um, yeah, I'm not gonna try. See, I'm worried I might roll them off the stands. But uh, yeah, the they have interiors, hatch doors, stands, and they're quite large. Uh, I've seen the brand name either listed as Mastercraft, but also some places have them listed as Darren, which is a distributor, so it's possible they just rebranded them. These are all kind of in final re-entry mode, that's why Apollo is kind of an off-color after going through re-entry. After everything has been jettisoned. 
Size-wise, it's really neat to, to see Mercury, the capsule. This project began in 1958, very late that year, after the success of the Explorer 1 satellite. Of course, that followed the launch of Sputnik in 1957. It was to be the, you know, U.S.'s first manned space vehicle. McDonnell Douglas won the contract and 20 capsules were ordered. Not all were planned, of course, for full manned flight. Some of them were non-occupied, some might have animals, some were for destruction, but anyway. Originally they were going to launch seven in the Mercury program, seven manned flights. Six ended up actually going into space when the program was completed. Of course, uh, Alan Shepard was the first, but that was a suborbital flight in May of 1961. Only lasted about 15 minutes. That was followed up by another suborbital flight by Gus Grisham. And then finally we have four orbital flights with John Glenn being the first of those in February of 1962. The final Mercury flight would be in May of 1963, ending the program. It was mostly just a proof of concept, although especially on the later missions, the science was done. The later missions could last a little over a day. The capsule had enough consumables for about a day, and it was basically just big enough for a person inside. It's about 10 feet long, about 6 foot wide, and it has the luxurious habitable space inside of about 60 cubic feet. The astronaut basically was strapped in to his chair, his couch, and that was it. He would wear a pressure suit, a, a space suit. The, the whole time, although it wasn't always pressurized, but it was there for emergencies. He had very limited control. There were just some reaction thrusters. Mostly it was either on autopilot or controlled from telemetry from the ground. It had no onboard computer. And it was launched the suborbitals with the Mercury Redstone rocket which was a very, you know, based on the German V2, although heavily modified. And then the orbitals were actually launched by an Atlas rocket. A little bigger, a little wider. It would also have an escape tower at the front, along with a little bit of instrumentation and communication gear in a module. And it would have the jets... The reaction jets strapped to the back, which would be jettisoned before re-entry so the heat shield wouldn't you know, get in the way. That was about it. It, wasn't, it was basically just um, a person stuffed in a can. Moving on, and really the reason I wanted to do this, Gemini is kind of that middle child people often forget, but in a way I think it was the most important and successful of the programs. Interestingly, this actually started after Apollo, at least on paper. It started in, in very late 1961, originally known as Mercury 2. It was there to kind of bridge the gap between Mercury and Apollo to test several things. And it was essentially just an expanded Mercury capsule, as you can see. It was also made by McDonnell Douglas. And, um, yeah, it held a crew of two. Uh, Gus Grissom was actually influential in its development and design, so it had a, a pilot and astronaut contributing heavily. It isn't much bigger it's only about 11 feet, at least the re-entry module. It did have kind of a service module it launched with, which contained equipment. 
And with that on, it was over 18 feet. But this would be jettisoned before re-entry. The good news was, where it was on the uh, Mercury, the life support and consumables had to be in the capsule with the uh, astronaut. With uh, Gemini, they could be supported outside, allowing for a larger inhabitable volume. The uh, diameter is only a little bigger. It's about seven and a half feet in this mode with the service module, I'll call it. It's not really its name, but I'll call it that just for simplicity's sake. It went out to about 10 feet. So these small increases in diameter plus less equipment in the cabin gave it an inhabitable volume of about 90 cubic feet. So woohoo! Going from 60 to 90, but you're also having two people instead of one. The commander would be on the left side here. The pilot would be on the right. And each uh, has a hatch. This first flew as an unmanned test in 64. With the first manned flights, they would do two unmanned flights, and then they would do ten manned flights from 65 through November of 66. And it would actually uh, do a lot of things. It would practice rendezvous, docking, maneuverability, and of course, spacewalks. It also had made the highest orbit, and I believe it still holds that record to date. It was uh, more pilot controlled. It was also the first to use uh, solid fuel cells. And it was also the first to have an onboard computer. Obviously, by today's standards, it wasn't even really a calculator, but compared to what Mercury had, which was essentially a pen and paper is the closest thing to a computer, uh, Jim and I actually had a real computer. So, there's that. It's also worth noting that um, Mercury had an escape tower. If the rocket malfunctioned, the capsule could be shot off with the tower. Gemini did not have this. Instead, it needed its front, they thought, for the uh, docking port. So they put ejection seats instead. This was very controversial and probably would not have had good results if ever had to be used, but um, they, they never did. It was thought that the ejection seats would save on weight, space, complexity. Problem is, they were also operating in a pure oxygen atmosphere and rockets, and yeah, no, nothing good was would have come from it. But uh, all ten manned missions went well. There, of course, there were, there were bumps along the way, but uh, everything was recoverable thanks to the astronauts. And therefore, we were able to lead into Apollo. As I said, this program actually began on paper earlier than uh, Gemini. It began in 1960. And the contract was actually awarded to North American. This is a much larger, considered much more spacious capsule. We're not that much taller, only about 12, 12 and a half feet, but we're quite a bit wider. We're at about 12 and a half feet wide. And we have an internal habitable volume of 218 cubic feet. So, more than double that of Gemini. And, of course, it too had its own service module, which was about 24 feet long, making the whole assembly in space uh, 36 feet. So, of course, the cabin could be mostly given over to the astronauts. This became very infamous during the Apollo 1 fire in 1967, which killed Gus Grissom, along with White and Chaffee. But the program wasn't derailed that long. Test flights were resumed quite quickly. The whole Apollo capsule was reworked. And by October of 68, Apollo 7 was the first manned, three-man 
American capsule in orbit. And actually, by December of that year, Apollo 8 already saw America orbiting the moon. And of course, Apollo 9 returned to Earth orbit to test the uh, lunar lander, the LM. Apollo 10 went back to the moon and did a flyby with the lunar lander. And then Apollo 11, do I need to even explain? 1969, July 20. Yeah. 12, 14, 15, 16, and 17 would all return to the moon. And the longest duration, the J missions towards the end, were staying there three days. Of course, Apollo 13 was aborted, but the astronauts made it home safely. And that was the end of the Apollo program to get to the moon in 1972, but not the end of the Apollo capsule. Three missions would be sent in 1973 to Skylab using Apollo, and then its final flight would be in 1975 with the Apollo Soyuz test program. And then, of course, America would not send men into space until 1981 with the Space Shuttle Columbia. And the shuttle would fly continuously with uh, small breaks because of uh, the Challenger and Columbia disasters. But it would fly until 2011. And that's kind of where we're at now. So yeah, I just thought I would show these models, kind of an overview. I'll probably go into more detail on each one later, but... So that would show America's three different space capsules. Alrighty, folks, I appreciate you tuning in. If you could, like, share, and subscribe. Any questions or comments, welcome on below. This is Nisha. Catch you very soon next time.